Okay, thank you. Be seated. Good evening. I'm Lisa Freeman, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences here at UIC. Welcome to this very special event, the investiture of Professor Yi Chao Wu as the inaugural TransUnion Endowed Professor in Data Science. I'd like to begin by recognizing a few individuals who are with us today. UIC Provost Karen Colley, Julius Ross, professor uh, and head of the Department of Mathematics, Statistics, and Computer Sciences. And of course, our honoree, Yi Chao Wu, professor of mathematics. I am especially pleased to welcome representatives from TransUnion, especially our three platform party members, Mr. Charlie Wise, senior vice president of global research and consulting, Mr. Michael Umlauf, senior vice president data science and, anal and an analytics, and Mr. Ch Todd Sello, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. We are delighted to have you here. We are also delighted to welcome and to thank TransUnion CEO, Chris Cartwright, who has also joined us here in the audience. Thank you so much. I'd also like to extend a general warm welcome to faculty from the Math Department's Probability and Statistics Group. It is deeply gratifying that so many faculty, staff, and esteemed donors and friends of the college and university are present today. Thank you all for being here, and I hope that you will join us for the reception that immediately follows the program. The investiture of a named professor is one of the most significant events in a faculty member's academic life, and in the life, too, of a college. It is a solemn, time-honored ceremony, but it is much more than ritual. The investiture is the university's formal recognition of the professor's stand, uh, outstanding record of achievement and the public affirmation of the university's confidence in the honoree's continued scholarly achievement. Today's investiture is even more meaningful because it is the inaugural TransUnion Endowed Professorship in Data Science. We are deeply grateful to TransUnion, a leader in the field of data science, for the opportunities that this generous endowment affords us. It is not an overstatement to say that our world is more reliant upon the availability of vast amounts of data more than ever before, and the decisions we make as consumers, citizens, and businesses depend upon information that is reliable, readily available, and easily accessible. The demand for data scientists has grown exponentially, and the colleges of LAS, engineering, and business responded by creating an, an undergraduate degree in data science. As we train students who will expand the knowledge and boundaries of this burgeoning field, we recognize the need to provide those students with hands-on experience and real-world real perspectives. 
This endowed professorship will allow the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences to continue as a leader in the field of data science research and education and to further the, the university's mission of expanding its impact beyond the classroom. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not take this opportunity to publicly recognize and thank former LAS Executive Associate Dean, Professor Dibian Majumdar, there he is, for initiating and cultivating our relationship with TransUnion. Thank you, Dibian, for your vision and all your work in helping to bring about what we celebrate today. Again, thank you all for joining us for this significant occasion for the college, the university, and for Professor Wu. I would now like to introduce the Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs of the University of Illinois Chicago, Karen Colley. Karen Colley, Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics, was appointed Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs in July 2023. As Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Kali is responsible for the planning, execution, and assessment of UIC's academic programs across its 16 colleges and the university library. In alignment with the university's mission, she supports the broadest access to the highest levels of educational research and clinical excellence and is committed to ensuring that all UIC, UIC students are prepared to pursue their chosen paths in life and to be productive and contributing members of their communities. Prior to her appointment as provost, Dr. Kali also served, and this is a long list, also served as acting provost twice, May through August 2021 and June 2022 through June 2023, interim dean of the university library uh, from August 2020 to February 2021, and Dean of the Graduate College for 10 years, from 2012 to 2022. Her research in glycobiology was NIH funded for over 25 years, and she currently serves as the Editor-in-Chief for the journal Glycobiology. Dr. Kali joined UIC in 1991 and has been recognized as a University of Illinois University Scholar the highest designation for a faculty member within the University of Illinois system. She received her bachelor's degree in chemistry from Duke University and her PhD in biochemistry from Washington University, St. Louis, and later continued her training in cell and molecular biology as an NIH-funded postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, Los Angeles. Please join me in welcoming Professor Karen Colley, Provost, sorry, Provost Karen Colley. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Freeman. And good evening and welcome, everybody. It's nice to see you. We are honored to have with us here this evening representatives from TransUnion, especially Mr. Todd Sello, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, as well as a UIC alum. Welcome. We are grateful for the generosity of TransUnion, which made this professorship possible. TransUnion and UIC have a shared commitment to the creation of more opportunities for students in the field of data science. And thanks to TransUnion's investment in the future of data science at UIC, we are well positioned to graduate students who will be grounded in the discipline and ready to take their place in society as scientists with real world skills. They also enter the workforce with competencies that come from a liberal arts education the ability to define, describe objectives, communicate effectively, and think critically, in addition to possessing the cultural competency integral to success in a global society. In addition to our shared commitment to creating opportunities through education, TransUnion and UIC share many of the same institutional values, a commitment to sustainability, diversity, inclusion, and workplace equality. The company has established several initiatives with the goal of ensuring fairness in the wor workplace, advancing gender equity in senior management, and creating more sustainable workplace and world. Our shared values are the foundation for a fruitful collaboration, a collaboration that will benefit students and society for years to come. On behalf of the University of Illinois Chicago, 
I sincerely thank TransUnion for your generosity, partnership, and the many opportunities that this endowed professorship will create for our faculty and our students. So thank you guys very much. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Todd Sello, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer at TransUnion. Mr. Sello joined TransUnion in 1997 and has held numerous roles with increasing levels of responsibility in the corporate finance department since then. He has held his current position since August 2017. His previous role, his previous titles include, and it's sort of like, it's a long list. Here. <laughs> uh, Senior Vice President and International CFO, Vice President Financial Planning and Analysis, and Vice President and U.S. Information Services CFO. He currently serves on UIC's College of Business Advisory Council and is a proud graduate of UIC, where he earned a bachelor's degree in accounting. And that's why I see the Dean of the College of Business sitting back there. <laughs> He is also a certified public accountant. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Todd Sello, who will now offer some remarks on behalf of TransUnion. Thank you, Provost Kali. Uh, I'm honored and privileged uh, to be able to briefly speak on behalf of TransUnion this evening. Um, as Provost Kali mentioned, I'm Todd Sello. I'm the CFO at uh, TransUnion. And I am a proud graduate of the University of Illinois at Chicago, but more on that in a little bit. Um, if you're familiar with TransUnion, you probably know us as a credit reporting agency. Maintaining credit histories on consumers is at the core of what we do, and we've been at it for over 50 years. After decades of maintaining and analyzing credit data, we have grown exponentially as a result of product innovation by leveraging our unique data assets and state-of-the-art technology, and by continuing to substantially invest for the future. In addition to credit data, over the last several years, we have expanded our product capabilities to help our customers mitigate fraud and to market with more precision. We've done all of this by building a holistic view of consumer identity. TransUnion's mission is to ensure every individual is reliably represented in global commerce so consumers and organizations can transact with confidence and achieve great things. We call this information for good. All of this is underpinned by data science, which is why we're here tonight. TransUnion does all this work in more than 30 countries and we have a workforce of approximately 13,000 uh, employees. Our global headquarters are about a mile away from where we're gathered here tonight. So needless to say, the opportunity for TransUnion to partner with a renowned educational institution uh, like UIC that is literally in our backyard and is educating and developing the high potential talent of the future in critical areas such as data science but also in machine learning and artificial intelligence, it's of the utmost importance to us. So to that point, TransUnion emphasizes building strong relationships with area universities. We look at these relationships as a way to nurture diverse talent, especially in STEM fields. Being able to partner with university research to use TransUnion data assets helps us to realize our purpose of information for good. Over the past decade, TransUnion has built successful partnerships with Northwestern University, the University of Chicago, and now UIC. As it pertains to UIC, initial discussions with TransUnion date back to 2016. The TransUnion team was impressed by UIC's commitment to quality and breadth of options in the data science field in the colleges of business, engineering, and liberal arts and sciences. As Chicago's largest university and only public research institution with an incredibly diverse population, the opportunity to partner with UIC was extremely compelling to TransUnion. 
As a way to initiate our relationship in early 2017, we contracted with UIC faculty on a series of consulting projects aimed at applying uh, statistical methods to improve sales effectiveness. In addition, UIC faculty participated in TransUnion customer events. Ultimately, all of these interactions and engagement led us to announcing the creation of the TransUnion Professor of Data Science in May of 2018. Professor Wu was selected as the inaugural TransUnion Professor of Data Science in the College of Liberal Arts in February of 2020. TransUnion is incredibly excited to have Professor Wu in this role. So congratulations. The investment in the endowed professorship helps us with our objectives to continue to drive innovation and to nurture talent for, future, for our future growth expectations, as I just discussed a few moments ago. While I realize we are here tonight uh, for the investiture of Professor Wu, um, as was already alluded to, um, it's important to also note that TransUnion is part of the College of Business's corporate partnership program. So between the endowed professorship in data science and the sponsorship of the College of Business, we have two tangible examples of how UIC and TransUnion can work together to advance each other's interests. And I believe this is just the beginning of what will be a growing and vibrant relationship between our organizations. And finally, for me personally, it's awesome to see UIC and TransUnion working together in such a collaborative manner and making a difference in the market and in the community. UIC holds a special place in my heart. First, I graduated, as you've heard, from UIC in 1997 with a bachelor's degree in accounting. I'll be forever grateful for how UIC prepared me for my career. Second, and probably most important, UIC is where I met my wife, Jennifer, who is here with us tonight um, in the second row. So since graduating from UIC, I've spent the last 26 years at TransUnion. Like UIC, I am forever grateful to the opportunity TransUnion has provided me throughout my career. So having both amazing organizations that I have had the good fortune to be part of working together is truly extraordinary for me. So congratulations again to Professor Wu, and thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Todd, for this uh, really thoughtful remarks, and um, especially for the ongoing connection you've had to UIC for so long. It's really uh, remarkable and special. Um, I'd like to uh, move now to the beginnings of uh, introducing Professor uh, Wu. Uh, so I'd like to invite uh, to the podium our head of the Department of Mathematics, Statistics, and Computer Science, Professor Julius Ross. Good evening. My name is Julius Ross. As Dean Friedman just mentioned, I'm the head of depart uh, the Department of Mathematics, Statistics, and Computer Science at UIC, and I have the honor of introducing Professor Yi Chao Wu. Professor Wu, Wu received his undergraduate education at Nankai University in Tianjin, China, and his PhD in statistics from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2006. Following an associate professorship at North Carolina State University, Professor Wu joined the faculty of UIC in 2017. He is currently a professor of mathematics and is a former director of the Statistical Consulting Laboratory. An expert in the field of machine learning, Professor Wu's research also encompasses functional data analysis, analysis of high dimensional big data, and analysis of network data. Throughout his career, Professor Wu has maintained a robust and steady stream of research funding through grants from the National Institute of Mental Health, the National Cancer Institute, and the National Science Foundation. His research has been published in leading peer-reviewed journals and book chapters, and, and he has presented at invited talks and conferences throughout the United States and abroad. For an indication of the high regard in which Professor Wu is held by his peers, one need look no further than his many honors and awards. He is a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, the American Statistical Association. He is an elected member of the International Statistical Institute and a receipt and a recipient of the National Science Foundation's prestigious Early Career Development Award. He's received the American Statistical Association Junior Leo Brayman Award, 
on statistical, uh, on statistical learning and data science. In addition, he is currently or has recently served on the editorial boards of the New England Journal of Statistics and Data Science, Canadian Journal of Statistics, Technometrics, and the Journal of Computational and Graphical Statistics. Professor Wu's prolific scholarly output and service to the profession are a testament to his deep commitment to the field of data science. Professor Wu is an equally dedicated colleague and teacher. He has served as a member of the department's data science major core co committee, chair of the PhD committee, and member of PhD and master's degree committees. As this brief list makes clear, Professor Wu is instrumental in preparing the next generation of statisticians and data, science, and data scientists, which makes him an ideal, ideal inaugural transunion professor of data science. I would like now to invite Dean Freeman and Provost Colley to the podium to begin the formal investiture. Professor Wu, please come forward. By the power and authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the University of Illinois, I am a, I'm proud to recognize Professor Yi Chao Wu as the recipient of the TransUnion Endowed Professorship in Data Science. Professor Wu, I welcome you to the podium to accept this honor and to give the inaugural lecture as the TransUnion Endowed Professor in Data Science. Thank you. So I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you for being here today. I'm deeply humbled to be selected for such a great honor. I extend my sincere thanks to Provost Colley and Dean Freeman for bestowing upon me this great honor. A special appreciation goes to TransUnion for their generous support, without which this momentous occasion would not have been possible. Thank you. I'm grateful to have the presence of Mr. Todd Fellow, Mr. Michael Omanoff, and Mr. Charlie Weiss, and also TransUnion CEO Chris Cartwright here with us. Your attendance as a special touch to this memorable event. Thank you. <coughs> Additionally, I want to thank Dean Freeman, Executive Associate Dean Dave Hoffman, former Dean Dandino, former Executive Associate Dean David Majanda, and Department Head Junius Ross, and also former department head, Brooke Shipney, for selecting me to receive this great honor. Your collective support and presence make this day even more significant. And I'm truly thankful for the privilege of standing here today. Thank you. So I will next give you an overview of my research I have done in the last 10 years or so. Thank you. So I have been working on high dimension data and variable selection, and in particular, non-parametric variable selection. So now everybody talk about that we are in the era of big data, right? The era of big data not only introduce data with the largest and largest sample size or larger dimensionality. For example, we have the genetic data and then we have the financial data. We are transunion, right? So we have financial data here. And then we, for the high dimension data, we need to do variable selection. And uh, for classical approach, you have best subset selection. Essentially, you enumerate all the possible models and then select the best one. But if uh, P is large, the number of uh, candidate models, two to the power p, which is uh, tremendous for you to handle. So people invented 
forward selection, backward elimination, and the stepwise method. So this method is saying you can add one variable at a time or delete a one variable time, and all combination of them. But still, they are, have limited power. And then in the modern approach, people proposed penalize, penalize approach such as lasso. So it stands for least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. And there are many other methods come along this line. Oh, uh, so somehow the notation does not come up well. So the least absolute um, shrinkage and selection operator essentially is for the linear model. So for linear model, you try to minimize the least squares, residual sum square to get the parameter. But lasso, what lasso does is essentially add a L1 penalty here. This part is due to the lasso here. And this may seem kind of abstract. So that this is an equivalent formulation which just convert this one into constraint optimization. Instead of penalized optimization, optimization, you have constraint optimization. You can prove they are equivalent and uh, here are some pictures to help you understand why this can do variable selection. So the ellipse here is the contour plot of the quadratic object function of the least squares. If you want to minimize this one, you go to the center here. The closer to center, the smaller the object function value. And then the red square here is a constraint for the lasso. You can see if the constraint is uh, loose, then you can achieve the global minimizer, which is essentially the ordinary squares estimator. But if, but if you, you know, shrink the, the domain here, and then your solution cannot achieve the global minimizer. And if you shrink further, and then your solution achieves sparseness here. So now the minimizer is here, then this variable beta two is at zero. In this case, in this way, lasso can do variable selection, right? And as you can see, a different choice of tuning parameter, you can do variable selection here. And then in another very famous uh, method in the literature called rigid regression. The difference is that you use L2 penalty instead of L, L1 penalty here. And the L2 penalty, because too smooth, you cannot do variable selection here. So this is equivalent formulation, just use a constrained version here. And then if you look at the graphic illustration, here it is. So you have the control of the constraint is like a circle here for the L2 penalty. Because it's L2 penalty, this, the constraint domain is a circle here. And then if the circle is a big, you have the global minimizer here. And if you shrink this one, your solution gets this to this point. If you move further, there's your new solution here, and so on and so forth. But I can see it does not give you zero, cannot do variable selection, right? But of course, there are some magic choice help you to get the zero here. So this reminds me of something interesting I heard last semester. So what's two, pi, two, plus, two plus two? So if you ask a mathematician, he will give you a rigorous proof that it's a four. <laughs> and this is a picture I draw by my nine-year-old son. And uh, he told me how to prove this one. <laughs> and if you ask an engineer, because the engineer needed to trim or measure it, and then he will tell you it's roughly four. But if you ask a statistician, he will ask you, what do you want to be? <laughs> because we think everything is random. So big data not only introduce you with the data with a large P, large N, but also the complexity and uh, of, uh, of the data here. So for example, on the left, you have the brain connective data. So each dot represents one region of your brain, and then the line introduces amount of uh, 
information exchange between two regions here. And the right is a cardiogram data. So those are non-Euclidean data here. So it's more complicated. So to analyze this data, we need to elevate from Euclidean space to general metric space. So general metric space essentially is a pair of domain set and a metric distance. So metric distance required to have these three properties. So first this one is actually identifiability, and then the second one is symmetry, symmetrical property, third one is triangle inequality. You can match to what you have in the Euclidean space. So example of the metric space is uh, one very easy to understand one is the, the sphere, the three domain sphere, and associated with the geodesic distance, the great circle distance here. So here are some more uh, examples of the metric space. And uh, for the next couple of slides, my primary setup is the following. So why could it be random object in a metric space? X is still Euclidean, it's scalars. And uh, classical regression essentially try to study when y belongs to the real line, the real number, then we try to study the conditional mean of y given x. But when we move to the general metric space, omega and d, then how to study the dependence of y and x? So in this case, the first fundamental question is that how to define the conditional mean here? What's the conditional mean of a random object conditioning on other objects, right? So we, in, in order to study that, we need to look at the, what's the unconditional mean? And fortunately, a conditional mean was defined before. So let's look at this slide. So can we define the mean to be the center here? If I directly connect these two points, I find the middle point here, then this point is not on the, on the sphere, right? So this is not a good idea good choice here. So this reminds me of the joke of the statistician stuck his head in hot oven and his feet in refrigerator, but he thinks on average I feel fine, <laughs> right? So this does not, right? So this, if you put a fine average, it's not on the, on, the, on the domain. So, and then a correct way to find this one is to find the gray circle and then find the middle point here. And then based on this, the free shade in, in 1948, it defined the free shade mean and the free shade variance, which essentially extended the classical, the, the classical mean and the variance to random objects. So basically just look at the squared metric distance between random y and the fixed point omega. And then take the expectation and then minimize over the domain then the minimizer is like a center of your data. It's like the free shade of me. And then they also define the variance here. And then in this 2019 paper, Peters and Muna proposed the conditioning free shade mean here. So you say you can just put a conditioning step here. In this case, we can study the regression. And uh, to, to propose this regression, we need to look at the classical linear regression again. So this is a classical linear regression model. To give the data, we have two fundamental goals. First one, you try to estimate the parameter. Second one, you try to make a prediction, future prediction, right? And the first goal does not help us to study the free shade, uh, uh, free shade mean case. And then the second one, does help. Let's see how this helps. So now, you just uh, trust me that uh, for linear regression model, the prediction at a future point is given by linear combination of your observed data in this way. But this linear combination is well defined in Euclidean space, but it's not, the addition is not working in, in the metric space because in the metric space there is no addition operate, operation there. So this does not help us. But 
we can write equivalent as a minimization problem. This one is exactly the minimizer of this quantity. It's a weighted squared Euclidean between, distance between zi and z. Now you minimize with respect to z, then the minimizer exactly given by this one. And then you replace this squared Euclidean distance by the squared metric distance, you can study the random objects now. So this is the definition of the free shade regression for the random, so I study how the random objects defense, depends on predictors. So the left-hand side is, uncondi is, uh, is a condi just a conditional free shade mean. The right-hand side is a particular given by this one, which is a population version of this. So this defines as a population model, right? And uh, this will tell you how to estimate. So now I want to tell you that, so this in this definition, there's no parameter beta. Remember, when I tell you Lasso can do variable selection, Lasso put a penalty L1 penalty on the regression coefficient to do variable selection, right? But now, there's no beta here. How to penalize this one? How to do variable selection? And then, I will tell you a general method to do variable selection, which is a perfect tool for this one. So, I'm sure you have done some plumber project at home. So, this, if, as long as I've done something similar, you should easy to understand this problem. So suppose this is a system with two inputs and one output. And I tell you only one input is important. Can you tell me which one by doing something simple? This slide tell you. You just contaminate one input while keeping the other intact. If you contaminate this one, this change a lot. Why? You contaminate the other one, it's not changing much. We can pretty much tell which one is important, right? So in this case, the left one is important input here. The right one doesn't matter that much. And based on this, we proposed a general variable selection approach. So I give you some heuristic in terms of statistical model here. Suppose you have one response, you have five predictors. And the response only depends on x2 and x5. So as a statistician, I can see one response, five predictors. I don't know which one is important, which one is not, right? Suppose Oracle exists, Oracle knows which one is important, which one is not. So in this notation, the green means a good predictor, the red means a better one should reject here, right? So if the Oracle exists, and suppose you have the magic power to trick the Oracle to play the following game. The rule of the game is that you must add a non-zero amount of measurement error to the predictors, that's the rule number one. Rule number two is that you also want to minimize the loss of prediction power. Typically, if you add a measurement error towards the predictors, you lose the prediction power, right? And then the second rule is that you want to minimize the loss of prediction power. Because the Oracle knows that Y only depends on the green ones, so the oracle will add all the measurement error to the bad ones while keep the green one, the good ones, intact. So in this sense, the oracle did not lose any prediction power, right? If you trick the oracle to play this game, then what we can do is that we can, we are statistician. We know how to measure variance, right? We can measure the variance of each predictor before the game and after the game. If the variance get inflated, then it means unimportant. If the variance stays same, that means important because the oracle will keep the important there, right? 
but there are good news and bad news. Bad news is that Oracle do not exist, all right? And the good news is that we are statistician. We have likelihood. Likelihood to us is like the Oracle here. So the, we can use Oracle to do this game. So we proposed a general four-step procedure to mimic this uh, Oracle game. So that's just uh, uh, too much to explain uh, in you know, one minute or two. So I'm going to skip this one. Just uh, trust me, we have four-step procedure to implement this uh, Oracle game at, uh, in, in, at the empirical level here. And then we can do variable selection. So the next part, I will show you some papers I have contributed using this general approach. So the first paper we wrote is in this 2004 paper. We apply this procedure to do variable selection for classification. So here is a simulation example. You simulate your class of three class data, the blue class, green class, red class here. The class information only depends on x1 and x2. You have additional eight, uh, eight unimportant predictors, right? And then if we do the variable selection, you can see using our procedure, you can see we can do a very good job of variable selection. We keep the important predictors in the model 100% of the time, while only keep the unimportant variable at a very low frequency here. And the, if you look at the prediction error, it's also best for our map model here. So that's our first paper to apply this general four-step procedure to do variable selection for non-parametric classification. And this uh, second paper is on the non-parametric regression. So it's, this is also a simulation example why the, depending on x1 and x2, I have three additional unimportant predictors. And can, you can see this is a solution path of our so, uh, um, uh, um, optimization problem. If tau moves the way here, you can see x1 comes in first, x2 comes in second, and then until this point, the unimportant variable comes in. So as long as you have the tuning criteria correctly done the job, you can achieve perfect variable selection. So this is for non-parametric regression. And we also extend this one to do so-called the structured recovery for attitude model. So for attitude model, essentially you just assume that the contribution of each predictor is additive, it's even though we assume it's non-parametric. So in this model, we try to answer the question is that is xj, is j's predictor important? Next one is j's contribution is linear or quadratic and cubic and so forth. So essentially we want to answer the question, What's the polynomial order of each function here? And then our method can help us to answer this question. And we also extend to structured recovery for generalized attitude model here. So essentially, you just, you, y may not be continuous, maybe categorical, or the binary or the count data. And then you use a link here, and then you can do the generalized attitude model here. And uh, we apply this one to analyze the merge and the acquisition data. So the merge is uh, defined as two business of similar size or scale of operation combined into a bigger one, a new company. Example is a GSK, the formation of GSK. And the second type of uh, what is a called acquisition. Typically, is one business buys another, often smaller business, right? And then, in particular, a special type of this one is called the leverage buyout. It's acquisition of another company using a significant amount of borrowed money. So a significant amount of borrowed money to meet the cost of acquisition. So one example, famous example, is energy future holding. So this transaction was done in 2007, I think. It was, the idea was based on the belief that a rising demand for energy would stretch supply and push up the electricity price. 
they just uh, better this uh, could happen. But unfortunately, short, shortly after the deal was complete, increased uh, horizontal drizzling of the fracture led to the U.S. shared share revolution and the energy price dropped, dropped significantly. So as a result, the company filed bankruptcy in 2014. And if we apply the, this our method to analyze uh, merge and acquisition data, we essentially try to answer the, identify what uh, who is a uh, leverage buyout? What kind of characteristic of a company could it be determined is it to be a leverage buyout target here? And then those are the predictors, and then the binary response is, is, is a, a leverage buyout or zero, not a buyout, leverage buyout. And then our method identifies two important predictors. The first predictor has a linear predictor, linear contribution, second one is a quadratic contribution. And the next one is a non-parametric interaction selection. So you may be wondering how we can model the interaction. What do you mean, that, do you mean by interaction, right? Suppose I work at a bakery. I bake cakes every day. And uh, for example, I can bake like uh, 50 cakes every day. And my boss, Jonas Ross, is more capable. He can bake like uh, 100 cakes every day. So if we act independently, our sum will be 50 plus 100, right? If how to model interaction. Suppose we are good friends, we collaborate well, then we team up we can contribute more. So we may make more than 150, right? So that's one way of interaction. Another way of interaction is that, suppose uh, the other day I overslept, I came late for work, and then Julius gave me a penalty. Give me a penalty of a half day salary, I hold a grudge to him, so I don't cl collaborate at all. So then if I put them, if you put me to work with juniors, then we may produce less than 150, right? That's how we model the interaction. So we have the main effect, each person's individual contribution, and then we have the joint contribution. Then we can use our method to perform the non-parametric interaction. So this is a bivariate interaction but of course, if you want to increase high order interaction, three way interaction, and so on and so forth, you can also do the job here. And uh, now let's take a, another look at the ridge regression. Ridge regression, as I mentioned to you, it has been criticized in the, hist in the statistical literature that you cannot do variable selection because this one the constraint is um, a penalty, uh, two penalties, is too smooth. You cannot do penalty, right? And then, but I t I'm going to tell you next, if I trick, twist the arm of a ridge regression, I can do variable selection. But uh, how? Remember, ridge regression essentially use the same ridge parameter in front of each pr pr parameter. So this uh, circle is a round circle here, right? But if I use an individual, each individual ridge parameter in front of each parameter here, then it's called an individual name penalized ridge regression. For example, if I have new j equal to infinity here, if you minimize this one, we know that infinity times anything positive equal to infinity, right? So in that case, if you minimize this one, your beta j minimizer will be exactly equal to zero. Otherwise, your objective function is infinity. You cannot be achieving the optimal value, optimal function uh, value here. In this way, we can make the rigid regression to do variable selection. So I wrote uh, this paper 
in 21. So essentially, a twist arm of the rigid regression, which has been criticized not to do variable selection, to do variable selection, all right? And it turns out this is the perfect tool to do variable selection for the global free shape regression. So why? Because you remember the free shape regression, the global free shape regression is defined this way. There is no regression coefficient to penalize to do variable selection, right? But if I look at the individually penalized rigid regression version, it's the only difference is just add this term here. Then, based on the same method in this paper, we can do a variable selection here. This is the step, three-step procedure to do variable selection for the global free shape regression to analyze a random object. So I have a, I, this slide is not updated. So basically, I have a grant, NIH grant, essentially try to, anal to analyze brain connectivity data using the, this um, uh, global free shape regression, variable selection for global free shape regression idea. So, so this one is saying tell you that I can also do the, so the free shape regression, they also propose a local version, which is the extension of the non-parametric regression. And we can also do variable selection for, the, for this method, for this uh, local free shape regression. And uh, in this paper, we try to do variable selection for partially linear regression. Partially linear regression is something a com combination of the linear regression model and non-parametric regression model. It's combined the strength of two models, and then we can also do variable selection here. And uh, we have a, a manuscript to do the generalized partially linear model as well. So next slides at just uh, it's about the free shade regression again. So the gen so the partially linear regression model combines strengths of both linear model and the non-parametric regression model, right? And then the partially global free shade regression we propose essentially combines strengths of global free shade regression, which is a extension of linear regression and a local free shade regression which is a non-parametric regression. And uh, we are working on variable selection for, for um, partially global fresh air regression right now. And uh, I have, uh, I've, this slide is not updated, but I have slides to acknowledge grant support from NSF and NIH. And I also on, want to thank for my former PhD students at UIC and both at NC State. And um, last, I want to th thank my family. I take this chance to thank my family, especially I want to thank my wife. Without her, I even won't be here speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wu, for sharing that uh, wonderful overview of your work. I, I look forward to the to be continued uh, and uh, want to thank again uh, TransUnion for um, enabling us to create this position um, and enable uh, the incredible research and findings that uh, Professor Wu is uh, developing uh, in amongst his colleagues and um, as a leader in his field. It's really uh, kind of astonishing and impressive. So. Very much, again, very congratulations. <laughs> so uh, this concludes our uh, program for the evening, our ritual ceremony, as it were. I wanna thank everyone again uh, for attending this special celebration, and I hope you uh, will uh, join us for the reception 
uh, in the uh, back of the room. And I would just also ask the platform party to stay up here for a very quick photo session. Uh, but thank you again. Congratulations, Professor Wu, uh, this wonderful, wonderful moment. Thank you.